to hell with that shit, am I right? Okay, so it goes without saying that this review is going to be very spoiler heavy. From minor spoilers to possibly major spoilers if I end up getting very caught up in the emotion of talking about this awesome series. Long story short, I love this series. Go check it out. If you want to go in fresh, go check it out and then come back and uh, have a listen to what I have to say and to see if you agree or disagree on certain things. I think it goes without saying that this is far superior to the Ben Affleck version. And that's even coming from a guy who, honestly, I don't think Ben Affleck's Daredevil is god-awful. It's bad. I, I totally think it's bad. But it's an enjoyable kind of bad. Sure, Affleck is kind of a bore. Jennifer Garner isn't really doing much. It's a very truncated um, plot to kind of encapsulate all the highlights of a character's mythology. It's like if they tried to make a Spider-Man movie that incorporated Venom, Gwen Stacy, uh, Uncle Ben's murder. Oh, wait. They did. It's definitely bad, but stuff like Michael Clark Duncan's Kingpin and Colin Farrell's Bullseye definitely make it a an, an enjoyable uh, viewing experience just for how over-the-top and go-for-broke they are. So, when I heard that Marvel got the rights back to Daredevil and that they were going to do a TV series about it, that seemed like a very smart move. And then we started seeing images of Charlie Cox as Daredevil, and he's in like this ninja outfit, and I'm still sold on it, because I'm like, it's in the Marvel Cinematic Universe for all intents and purposes. They know how to, they, I have a feeling they're going to do well, and they're going to know how to handle this right. Despite first season Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. shakiness, I have a feeling Marvel will get a handle on Daredevil well, because it is a main Marvel character. You're not trying to create kind of tertiary satellite-type characters to hold the focus of an entire show. You have this established uh, fan base with Daredevil. You have this established fan base with the Kingpin, with even his supporting cast like Foggy and Karen Page and Stick and so forth. So I, I wasn't too worried about this series. But man, I wasn't expecting to be blown away by how awesome it is. I knew it was going to be good. I had no idea it was going to be great. Out of all the MCU properties, from the first Iron Man to the Avengers to Agents of Shield and Agents of uh, Agents of Shield and Agent Carter, and all the one shots and everything incorporated into this cinematic universe that they've created, so far, Marvel's Daredevil is the best acted and most consistent in terms of that. Because, I mean, yeah, you have Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man. Very charming actor, can hold the focus of a movie very well. But then you'll have some characters off to the side who probably aren't as great. <laughs> Pepper Potts. <laughs> um, even though she's not terrible, but at the same time you're kind of like, mm, you can't help but notice that it's going with Paul Troll mugging. The difference between the movies and this is I can't imagine being able to really take much of Robert Downey Jr.'s smarminess through a 13 episode run. Two hours I think is a good <laughs> interval for that guy. But yeah, that would begin to great. With a character like Murdoch where he definitely had, you can plot out his character's arc and he does actually grow and develop from beginning to end. That can hold your attention for a 13 episode series. But the great thing about it is, is not only is Charlie Cox as Matt Murdock in Daredevil a great uh, lead role, but all of the supporting characters, his villains, the, the smallest little cameos here and there are so well done, so well acted that I had nothing but like emotion pumping through me for this entire series. I binged the hell out of this thing after I got home from work yesterday. I uh, ended up finishing off how many episodes 10 episodes yesterday after work and then I just fin I just finished up the uh, last three this morning when I woke up an emotional roller coaster in every sense of the word it's dark it's gritty it there's bleakness there but then when when you see our heroes really pull through and accomplish something you feel that sense of accomplishment with them you feel a sense of accomplishment in the second episode when 
Matt Murdock is just beaten to shit trying to rescue this kidnapped boy. And at the end, he just walks out of there. It's, it's a, I'm sure there were cuts, but it's like this long tracking shot of of Daredevil coming into this Russian-like safe house, beating the hell out of these Russian mobsters just with his hands, just with his bare fists, like, not got with like rope tied around him, so you know, gives that extra like oomph, like brass knuckles almost. And he's just beating these guys to shit, not with elaborate wire work or anything like that, just with some close quarters, hand to hand combat, a couple of flips here and there. But honestly, just he just he lightly just jumps, places a foot, and just leaps off the wall like that and just decks people left and right and just beats people to hell. And then he finally goes into this room and Brings, tells us, like, takes off his mask, tells the kid, don't be scared, I'm here to help you, I'm here to take you back to your dad, and you hear the kid be okay, and then he just walks out cradling this kid amidst all these broken bodies on the ground. That is awesome. The first five minutes of this show won me over with his, essentially, what would, I, I don't know, one of his first nights out, and he's, like, stopping this human trafficking ring at the docks. The opening title sequence, everything about, I love this title sequence. Deborah Ann Wall is Karen Page. She was, at first I thought it was going to be one of those things where like, oh, well, she's going to be overly bubbly after the first episode, even though she goes to some dark shit in the first episode. And then she ends up working for uh, Matt and uh, Foggy Nelson. And you think like, okay, well, she's just going to be kind of the sidekick now. To all their adventures and what you know in legal and criminal activities and it turns out like she has a really fulfilling arc throughout this show that really works well and she has a lot of emotional gamuts to run through to say the least with certain things that at the end like you're just happy to see her smile a little bit even though she's not fully like recovered Eldon Henson as Foggy Nelson the thing about Foggy Nelson is that, and this is some this is something mainly I picked up after John Favreau did a stint as him in, <laughs> like he did Jail Time, did a stint as him in 2003's Daredevil. Is that I was afraid Foggy Nelson was going to be overly abundant comic relief. I'm not sure exactly if that's his consistent or very constant role in the comics. I, I haven't read a lot of the Daredevil comics. Initially, I was kind of fearing that he would be kind of, oh, I'm your I'm your best friend, g g garsh comic relief. Get jiggy with it and be, like, spewing catchphrases or anything like that. If anything, he became one of my favorite characters outside of Daredevil and the Kingpin. He became one of my favorites. Because not only does Henson play him as very likable and funny, but does he have a lot of shit that he has to work through in this series as well. Trying to be a friend, but also harboring feelings for Karen, you know, in a sense, there's aspects of where he feels like he's living in Matt's shadow, you know, Matt being kind of like, always been kind of the pretty boy of the Nelson and Murdoch team up, as it were, and being a little bit more confident, I guess, as a lawyer, and over the course of the series, Foggy really develops that confidence, and the and kind of the gumption needed to be a very successful lawyer. After halfway through the series, him and Matt have something of a falling out. Henson delivers on the conviction in his voice when he addresses Matt about, calls Matt out on some bullshit. You, you feel the pain that this guy feels, that essentially one of his, his only, his best friend, you know, has kind of betrayed him in a way. You don't end up hating the character for hating Matt, for a little bit or anything like that, you you just end up sympathizing royally with him. Because what this show also does very well is take time out in certain episodes to do flashbacks. To do flashbacks to when, before Matt was even blinded. In the flashbacks, they jump around to different aspects of Matt's past. And then you see Matt and Foggy go to law school together and actually you know, in their internship together and everything like that. And you, you, you invest in this friendship. You invest in Matt and his dad's relationship. You buy that relationship. You totally invest in those characters so that even though his dad is only in a couple episodes in flashbacks, that when the murder of his dad does happen, sorry, spoilers, but that's 
what happens in the comics. I mean, he's, yeah, Daredevil's kind of batman in that sense. As opposed to 2003's Daredevil, it does, again, with the truncating of the mythology, it doesn't try to tie everything too close together. I mean, it isn't really revealed, like, who the murderer of Matt's dad is. It's not really the main focus of uh, the show. I mean, it's it's just kind of straw that broke the camel's back and sends Matt on his on his quest, essentially. And it works for that. Maybe they'll delve a little bit more if this gets another season, which I'm sure it will. It's, it's, it's a great show. But I'm glad for at least now that wasn't tying into the Kingpin story arc like it did with uh, very badly in the 2003 version. Bob Gunton plays Leland Owsley, the owl. Bob Gunton you will know as being the warden from the Shawshank Redemption and being uh, the head administrator uh, who's like harumphing at Patch Adams throughout the entire movie Patch Adams. Basically, he's every old man grump in the past 10 or 15 years <laughs> you've seen. And he plays an old man grump in here. Like, the dude can't get away from being the warden from Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> but he does a good job with it. Rosario Darson, Dawson shows up for a couple episodes as Claire Temple. And kind of a mix between her and Night Nurse, which is really cool. And here's the whole deal is that she's only in a couple of episodes, but she does a great job doing what she has to do, kind of patching up Matt Murdock from battle and kind of harboring feelings for him, having a romantic... Thing that it isn't really explored. That's the other thing I'm grateful for, too, is that they had many opportunities to kind of tie in a very melodramatic type of love story, either between Matt and uh, Claire or Matt and uh, and uh, Karen. But they they there might be potential for that down the line, but they really knew how to keep focus on what on the important part of the story. Vincent D'Onofrio as the kingpin. The Kingpin has never really been a character I've given two shits about. Be it in Daredevil or Spider-Man. He, he's never fascinated me. Any Anytime I'd ever read stories about him or read a story involving him, he's always just this cold, calculating, evil dude. And that's pretty much all I see. I mean, there might be stories where they do try to very much develop his character... I've never really been interested in him, and it's not because he's not just a straight-up supervillain. Like it's it's because of the fact that just he, he always seemed very two-dimensional to me, very one-note type of I'm an evil big boss type guy. Vincent D'Onofrio <laughs> made me love the Kingpin. If the Kingpin was like this in the comics consistently, I would have read a hell of a lot more Kingpin stories than what I have. He uh, <laughs> he is a marvel. No pun intended. He is truly spectacular in this role. Everything I've kind of gathered about other versions of the Kingpin, from the comics to the 2003 version to even like stuff like the animated series from like Spider-Man, is that he's always been this cocky, very, very know-it-all, like swaggering type of character. That is so not this character. <laughs> D'Onofrio plays into this character's insecurities and fears like no one else. He, I can't, I can't describe it. There are times where you kind of feel like the character is a little out of place, given all kind of the grounded reality of the show. But then you buy it because D'Onofrio sells this vulnerability on the guy's face. You and you totally buy the fact that this character would all of a sudden go from kind of cowing and timid to larger than life. He gets very emotional at times, but tries to keep it hidden within the dark recesses of his soul and does a lot of facial tics. <laughs> but when he pulls it together, he can pull it together. But when he lets loose and straight up murders people with his bare hands or with a fucking car door taking off your goddamn head because you interrupted his dinner with his lady. Fuck! <laughs> D'Onofrio is frightening. He is so frightening. But at the same time, he makes you give a crap about this character. You could totally believe that it could go from a little kid caving in his dad's skull with a hammer to this towering mass of just neuroses and and violence 
but he's he's very sympathetic at times. Like you you do very much kind of get what he's about because he keeps repeating that he's all about trying to save uh, this city, save Hell's Kitchen, to save his neighborhood. And he says it with such conviction that he truly does buy into the fact that he is a good Samaritan and he just has to do very horrible stuff to make progress happen. You buy that. D'Onofrio owns that. But like I said, he, his presentation with with all this and building up into violence and saying, I'm not here to threaten you. I'm here to murder you because you threatened my mother. And shit like that. Like, he explodes at the drop of a hat and you totally buy that. He, he, he is awesome to watch in this show. Like, every time they turn focus to to Wilson Fisk in this. I I couldn't take my eyes off the screen. I mean, there were there were times every once in a while like I'd kind of just, you know, I'd be like, "Okay, cool, cool." I'd just send a quick tweet while there was a foggy and Murdoch scene going cuz I get I get the idea of their banter, but with D'Onofrio, like I have to fucking watch him. <laughs> I have to watch every move he makes. He is fascinating to me. Uh, I mean, as an actor, but also within this character, within the skin he's taken on for the Kingpin, he is just amazing. Unfortunately, the Kingpin is kind of saddled with some unnecessary bits. And I'm not talking about his assistant, Wesley, who, curious enough, there was an assistant named Wesley in the Affleck version, too. I wonder if, I wonder if this was kind of Marvel's way of saying, we could take the script that you had for the original Daredevil movie and make it way better. 20th Century Fox. <laughs> like, I wonder if some points of this, I'm like, that sounds awfully familiar, like, from the 2003 version. I'm kind of wondering if they were giving a big finger to 20th Century Fox at a certain point. Like, his assistant, Wesley, is really cool. Like, there was a point where I kind of thought Wesley, there was going to be, like, a Tyler Durden type thing, where Wesley's just a figment of his deranged imagination, but then other characters start interacting with him, so I'm like, oh, well, there goes that theory. But Wesley's cool as kind of like his only friend or only advocate. But then you get to um, Ayelet Zurer, I want to say that's her name, as Vanessa, who is this art gallery owner and becomes Wilson Fisk's love interest. To the point where, by the end, spoilers I guess, but by the end of the series, he has proposed marriage to her. That'd be great and all, if they gave any semblance of backstory or character to this character. And this is no knock against Ayla Zura, against the actress, because she is giving her all with this material. She she isn't soft-soaping us on, on her performance, it's just that... She's just kind of there. She pops up. Wilson Fisk, Fisk asks her out. They end up going to that dinner, which is interrupted by a Russian mobster, and then she gets an inkling of who he is, which leads to that Russian mobster losing his head <laughs> via car door. And then he has kind of a scene with her where he basically confesses everything that he's doing, everything that he's done, that he's not a nice person. And her whole thing to it, without so much as really getting into her motivation for why she should stay with him, is that, okay, I'm with you till the end. And then that's it. She's just with him till the quote-unquote end throughout everything. Like, he tries to send her away because he finds himself in the crossfire of certain things, and she's like, nope, I'm here by your side. Why? Why? What? What is the motivation for her wanting to stay with this guy? I don't. I don't think she's ever really explains it in the series as to why it's worth the risk to be around this powerful and dangerous man. If if they had offered some insight as, into like how and why she would risk that all, like what her character's motivation would be for wanting to stay, like she just and then she just becomes like essentially the trophy wife. And there, were, there could have been opportunities to make that character just as resourceful, uh, conniving, and manipulative as he is if they had explored her a little bit more. But essentially, she's just kind of there to humanize Wilson Fisk more, which I don't think was overly necessary because just based off D'Onofrio's performance, you can tell there's vulnerabilities there. When you start getting into the background of the character himself, you can tell there's some semblance of humanity there. Him having a love interest kind of doesn't 
add anything to the plot. It doesn't take away anything necessarily, or it isn't too big a distraction. But it she she just was out of out of a show full of very efficient and very well run roles and plots. That was the one subplot and one character that I felt you could have cut out entirely, and it wouldn't have made a difference. He he gets more emotional about his assistant dying than he does about having to send her away. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, she she is completely kind of arbitrary to anything that's really going on in the plot. I don't know. That that's why I nitpick out of the whole show is just that she felt a little unnecessary. But other than that. This was a fun show. This was a fun journey to take with uh, Murdoch and company. And like I said, no one is sleepwalking through anything. They brought in a Ben Urick that I like better than Joe Pantaleone. Yeah, the daredevil. <laughs> I don't know. That's a terrible Joey Pants impression. I like this version of Ben Urick better than his. It's a shame that he... I... I... And this is just from me being a fan, being really kind of upset that, uh, yeah, Ben doesn't make it through the whole show, which is a shame because he's let go of his newspaper and I was seeing the opportunity for him to be like, ooh, maybe next season he could start working for a certain paper called the Daily Bugle. Now that you can do that, Marvel, he was a character I really grew to like. He had this side story for his character that... It was very sad. It was very, This show made me feel bad about supporting characters getting offed. It made me feel sad for this elderly... I mean, it is a sad... It would be a sad circumstance anyway, but it made me feel bad for this elderly uh, Spanish woman who's fighting for her tenement home, essentially, and everything like that, that she gets, you know, killed to further the Kingpin's goals, because all the characters have a kind of a connection to her. It's not like just a one episode, like, oh, they killed this lady, and now we're pissed about it. Like, she's a character that's in several episodes, and you see her develop relationships with Matt, with Foggy, with Senor Foggy, with, um, with Karen especially, because Karen, you know, like, buys her groceries and, like, looks after her in a way and kind of takes care of her. It, it made you invest in a character who's not even through the full run of the series. It made me invest in the relationship between Matt Murdock and Stick, played by Scott Glenn, who was awesome in his guest role. And he's only in one episode. And that just shows you how well put together this machine is, how well executed the story is, how well researched and well done all the performances are. Even if you aren't a diehard Marvel fan, if you, I mean, even if, if you aren't a fan of, like, Avengers or anything like that, if you haven't really tapped into the whole, like, superhero shared universe stuff, that's totally cool. You could come into this as, like, as, like, a House of Cards thing or, like, a True Detective style. If, if you like those types of shows, you could definitely get behind something like this. Or if you were a fan of stuff like The Wire or um, Homicide, you would... You would get behind this show, I think, pretty well. Because it plays more into, like, a vigilante type thing than anything having to do with superheroes. There's no... Honestly, a lot of the mystic stuff... There's not a lot of mystic stuff. Some stuff is alluded to. Um, Sci-fi stuff. Other than the fact that they just reference that they're in the Marvel Universe. And not, like, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. referencing. Like, they're not dropping, like, oh, well... You know, don't be like Jason. Like I like Jason Fury says, it's like, oh, don't be mad like the Hulk. <laughs> but um, there are references. It is in that universe, but it they're well done. Like Ben Urick has articles on the back of his wall detailing like the Hulk's fight in Harlem in Incredible Hulk. Like it's a front page story of the Hulk battling the Abomination, and then he actually wrote an article about the battle for New York. This takes place after the events in the Avengers, but. It ties in well because it's about rebuilding. It's about rebuilding certain parts of the city that were affected. And that ties in very much so to Wilson Fisk's plans for the city. A lot of the Marvel winks to the audience, they're either more subtle or they're just left out altogether. And that works for this show. It works for the nature of Daredevil. He is street-level hero. It makes sense that he would find himself consorting with the likes of Luke Cage, Jessica Jones, and Iron Fist more so than Tony Stark or Captain America. Who's to say? Maybe they will get their chance to kind of 
join forces with the other characters at some point. But for right now, it's fun to kind of have his own world to explore. And I hope they explore it further. I'm looking forward to seeing more of this show. It's one of the better balanced products out of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It's not fully superhero. It's not fully drama. Not fully crime thriller. It's a nice mixture of everything.